Well, let's try and apply this pathophysiology to explain what's happening in type 1 diabetes. Now, I remember quite a few years I was confused about the fact that this is a long-term degenerative process. But, of course, the patients just present with a very short history, maybe only a week or so of feeling unwell. So how do we tie in together this idea that there's a long-term degenerative process as a result of what we now know is autoimmune destruction of the beta cells, but the fact that the patient complains of being ill over a relatively short period of time, and they can be diagnosed with diabetes type 1 in, in, in a week or, or less even? Well, this graph explains it, actually. Because what we actually have here, going up and down here, we have beta cell mass. So this is the number of beta cells present in the pancreatic islets. So if we add up the total number of beta cells in the million or so pancreatic islets. This is their total mass. And this is time going along the bottom axis. So to begin with, the patient's normal, they're not diabetic, and the beta cell mass is normal. But then there's this process called insulitis starts. And insulitis means inflammation of the pancreatic islets, particularly of the beta cells, because they are being attacked by the body's own immune system. And this causes inflammation in the beta cells. This is called insulitis. And as this process goes on, more and more beta cells are killed, therefore the total number or the total mass of beta cells gradually goes down. So during this time, the patient will be perfectly normal because they've still got quite a few beta cells left. In fact, more than enough to control their blood sugar levels. But then eventually, when more and more beta cells are lost, the patient will go into this phase of glucose intolerance. But in type 1 diabetes, you're probably not going to pick that up. Even though the patient is glucose intolerant, you're probably not going to pick it up unless you do a glucose tolerance test. And it's only when the patient's lost, this has got 70 to 90 percent, it's probably actually more 80 to 90 percent. It's only when the patient's lost the vast majority of their beta cells down at this level that they actually start to suffer from the clinical features of diabetes. So they start off being normal. The beta cell mass goes down progressively over a period of, probably over a period of two, a couple of years to do this. It's not a quick process. This is going on for a year or two, or even more, inside the patient's pancreatic islets. But as the infl inflammation goes on, more and more beta cells are lost until eventually when the patient's lost 80 or 90% of their beta cells, then at this point, and from this point on downwards, they're no longer able to control their blood sugar levels and the clinical features of type 1 diabetes present. And this can be quite an acute event, often precipitated by an infection or something. But the patient can present with just a history of a week or two of not being very well. But even though this process has been going on, almost at a subclinical level, in terms of the patient not having clinical features for several years before they actually present. And then they go down and down and down until in type 1 diabetes, basically all of the beta cells are lost, generating a complete insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. So in diabetes type 1, the pathology is starting with the beta cells. It's the beta cells that are killed. But in type 2, it's different. The way I think about, about type 2 is that the insulin receptors are affected first. Now, actually, the beta cells are affected in type 2 at a relatively early stage. But because quite a lot of them are retained, it doesn't cause clinical features. So in type 2, it's the loss of insulin receptors or the degrading or the non-functioning of the insulin receptors that are causing the problem. And let's look at this graph that explains this. And we'll see how different it is to type 1.
So what we have here is this blue line is the plasma glucose level. And this starts off as being normal, and we'll count this bit as normal here. So this section of the graph here is normal. This is, this is the normal range. Now, insulin resistance develops first, and the insulin resistance is caused because the insulin receptors no longer respond to the insulin as effectively as they should. So even although the pancreas can be chucking out quite normal levels of insulin, the receptors on the cells are unable to respond to that. And because the insulin receptors are unable to respond, the levels of sugar in the blood will start to go up. And if the level of glucose in the blood goes up, that's going to be detected by the beta cells and they're going to produce more insulin. So what we actually see in the early stages of type 2 is that the blood sugar levels might rise a bit, but to compensate for that, the pancreas produces quite a lot more insulin. So here the pancreas is producing more insulin, and although there are less functional insulin receptors, that can be compensated for, at least for a period of time, by the high amounts of insulin. So because the insulin here is higher, because the beta cells have got a higher output, the plasma glucose levels can be maintained in a relatively normal range. So this period of time here, there's insulin resistance, but not necessarily over diabetes. It's like a pre-diabetic phase. But because the beta cells have had to push out a lot of insulin over a long period of time, what we say is the beta cells have a high obligatory output. That's going to wear the beta cells out. At least this is the way I think of it. The beta cells are worn out because they have a high obligatory output of insulin. And at a particular point, the beta cells won't be able to maintain the high output of insulin. Therefore, the amount of insulin will start to drop off. So in this period of time, there's reduced beta cell function. Therefore, plasma levels of insulin are dropping off. And of course, as plasma levels of insulin drop off, plasma levels of glucose are going to increase. And when fasting blood glucose reaches 7 millimoles, or random blood glucose reaches 11.1 millimoles, then the patient is defined as having diabetes mellitus. And in this case, it's a diabetes mellitus type 2. So very often, by the time type 2 diabetes is diagnosed, beta cell function and presumably beta cell mass has already dropped down to something like 50% of normal levels. So presumably it's been dropping for some time. And then when there's insulin resistance and when the beta cell mass goes down to about 50%, then the person is overtly diabetic. Their blood sugars are above 7 fasting, above 11.1 .1 random, and therefore will define this person as being diabetic, type 2 diabetes. But as time goes on, the beta cell mass progressively decreases in type 2 diabetes. So it starts off with the insulin resistance problem, but then the high blood sugar levels and the obligatory high insulin output wear out the beta cells and beta cell mass starts to decline. And after diagnosis, beta cell mass will carry on declining. Now, good glycemic control can probably reduce the rate at which the beta cells die off because high levels of blood glucose probably contribute towards beta cell death. But even with reasonable control, the amount of beta cells will gradually go down to 40%, down to 30%, down to 20% of what they were when the person was young and healthy. And what studies have shown is that typically... Someone, needs diet, uh, someone with type 2 diabetes needs to start insulin injections around about seven years after their initial diagnosis. So normally in type 2 diabetes, a patient can be maintained on diet, exercise and oral hypoglycemics. 
for a period of time. But then as the type 2 diabetes progresses and more beta cells are lost, then typically after about seven years, this is an average, it could be less, it could be more, but typically after about seven years, the patient needs to start taking insulin as well. And this is explained by the fact of this progressive beta cell loss. This doesn't mean the person has become type 1 diabetic. They are still a type 2 diabetic, but with more advanced disease. And they now need injections of insulin to maintain blood sugar levels within normal ranges.